One, two. Check. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. And all the time. How have you been? I honestly felt so much at home. And especially when it came to our coming and we had to do that song. I just felt at home. I'm glad to be with you here today. Um, it has not been very easy for me to secure this appointment because of so many, so many engagements. But I thank the Lord, he has made it possible for me to be here. I also want, in a very humble way, to request the Adventurers Club leadership to forgive me for not coming in club uniform. Please don't feel offended in a way that you won't even listen to the message. I request that you may forgive me for that. I also want to appreciate the fact that this church is one of the very unique churches we have in this country. And it remains unique. And I pray for you. The Lord will continue blessing you as you serve him in this part of the territory. A pastor, a Kali in our absence, he spoke to me and he welcomed me to come to his church. And I also want to thank my friend and my leader, Pastor JP, who asked me to come and stand on his behalf. And I am not able to fit into his shoes. But I ask God to be gracious to enable me to speak. Thank you, Pastor Sami, for being very consistent. Sami is my friend. And when you send friends to people that you want, then it becomes very difficult for them to say no. Thank you, Sam, for having me here today. I will go straight to the message. Um, this being the third Sabbath for this very special month for the youth ministry, the General Conference of the Adventist Church Youth Department secured this Sabbath annually that we may come and speak to encourage both our young people and parents as they serve and have a relationship with God. Particularly this Sabbath, the theme that has been agreed globally that is being used to speak and to challenge believers is, as you can see, I discovered there's a very good banner up here. Can you all of us read that banner? Okay, let's read one to start. Uh, uh, oh, we are reading the theme, no, not everything in the banner. Uh. <laughs> so please start where there is Jesus, okay? Let's go one to start. Wow. Jesus knows he takes care of you. Now, when I saw this theme or title subject for today, and I saw the suggested text that I've been given there, I struggled. And I want to again request to be forgiven because I will move away from the text that was posted and read and I will get another different text to allow me to be able to speak on this theme. Do you allow me to do that? Thank you so much. Jesus knows he cares or he will take care of you. Allow me then to take you to the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, we are going to remind ourselves of a, a very familiar story, which I thought would fit in, in illustrating that indeed God knows us and he takes care of us. Chapter 21 of the book of Genesis, 
we are going to consider verse 9 down to verse number 18. I'll read very quickly. Please come along with me as I read. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, who she had born to Abraham, scoffing. Therefore she sent to Abraham, cast out this born woman and her son, for the son of this born woman shall not be here with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the Lord or because of your born woman. Whatever Sarah has sent to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the born woman, because he is your seed. 14. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and putting it on her shoulder, he gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Bathsheba. And the water in the skin was used up and she placed the boy under one of the shops. Then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot. For she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat up opposite him and lifted her voice and wept. 17. And God heard the voice of the Lord. Then the angel of God called to her out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, her Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. For God has heard the voice of the Lord where he is. Arise. Lift up the Lord and hold him with your hand. For I will make him great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in this place and for this message as it is in heaven. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. You said, if you be lifted up, you shall draw all men unto yourself. And so, my Father, this morning I pray that may I not be seen, may I not be heard. But may you be seen and heard as you speak to us all. My request, Father, is that you may put us into my mouth. And order my lips to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus knows. He takes care of you. Have you found yourself in a situation of hopelessness, distress, Brokenness. You are in a situation where no one understands your pain and what you're going through. A situation where those that you trust and have turned to be your betrayers. A situation where you thought that you belong to a family, but the family itself has turned against you. You have no one on earth to trust, to lean on, or to speak to you. And a lot of things are being spoken about you everywhere. And you have no way to convince people that what is being spoken about is not true. Neither do you have any way to change the situation. You are left to wander alone in the world and you feel so much like you are thrown deep into a horrible pit. And all you have is God in your life. Friends, at times we walk through this life bearing scars of untold pain which was inflicted on our lives by those that we loved. Yet, I am here this morning 
to speak to such a person who bears such scars and pain let you know that I have a promise that I've received from Jesus that he says he knows your situation not only does he knows your situation but he says I take care for your pain you see friends the story that we're having this morning is rather very unfortunate when it's read from the face value of the text. God appears to Abraham and he tells Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation from your seed. Of course, we all know the story. Abraham is very aged. The wife is past menopause. But how it is possible that God can make me an old man and my wife who is worn out and past menopause have a great nation from my own seed? How possible is this? Has God flattering me? Oh, of course, we know truly God came through. But before Isaac was born, when Abraham sat with his wife and waiting for too long before this promise would be realized, Sarah suggested to Abraham, I think my husband, you know, at times God speaks in parables. You know, my husband, at times God wants us to use our common sense. He is said that we're going to have a seed that will become a great nation. But, but, but God also knows through science, it is impossible for us to have a child. Maybe my, my husband, God is, 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 is moving us to, to, to use our common sense. And you know, he brought to us a beautiful young girl here. Who do not turn to this girl and fulfill the promise of God. And Abraham felt a lot of sense in what the woman said. And indeed, he got to her girl and a boy Ishmael was born. Are you with me? So Ishmael is born. And as Ishmael is born, Abraham's family rejoices. Abraham says, God, thank you. You have removed the shame from my life. And Sarah's happy says, thank you, Hagar. You have removed the shame from my husband. Now we know that Abraham indeed has a seed and his nation shall be great as God promised him. Not too long before about 13 years later God appears to Sarah and tells Sarah you've got to confess you've got to repent you led your husband to a wrong decision I never meant Hagar to give Abraham a seed I met you Sarah and Sarah is like what, 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 what do you mean how me? I even don't know how to do that thing anymore. All feelings are gone. But even though I would force issues in this thing, uh, uh, biologically, it is impossible. And go on to your Sarah, don't you be worried, Sarah. I have a master of impossibilities. You see, Isaac is born. A few days after Isaac is born, one day Sarah is about a business in the home, uh, the home, and, and then he, she witnesses Ishmael and, and, and Isaac playing and, and kind of, you know. But by the way, just to let us know, um, at this time uh, Isaac is just a toddler because the Bible says after winning the boy. Uh, but, but we know in history and if you check your people very well by now uh, Ishmael is about 14 years of age so, so the, 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 these are two people who may not have very bonded games to play but, but so, somehow because they are siblings they are playing together but, but the Bible says Sarah noticed Ishmael scoffing or mocking Isaac there is nothing that is painful in our lives than when a family member mocks you. You would bear any pain from out there. But when a family member mocks you, belittles you, and makes you feel nothing, then you don't know what to turn to because when you are scoffed out there, you can run back home. So Sarah watched that scene. And she said, Enough. Is enough. Can somebody say amen? Now let, let, let me speak to you friends and let you know. In the plan of God, there is always a time when enough is enough. 
And you need to appreciate that as a, as, as a child of God, as a man or woman in a relationship with God. Sarah kept on watching. And I am persuaded and deeply to believe that this was not the first incident when Sarah witnessed Ishmael behaving funnily towards Isaac. This must have filled the cup and the cup was overflowing. And Sarah says, this cannot continue. Now the Bible says, Sarah went to Isaac and it went to Isaac. Live long, oh my Lord. But from today and forth, this bold woman and her son must go. This bold woman and her son must go. You know, verse number 10, the Bible says, Sarah, you know, Sarah told Abraham that <laughs> the reason why this born servant, this woman and her son must go is because hmm, this son of this woman shall never share in Isaac's inheritance. Are you with me? This son of a bored woman shall never inherit or share or have a portion of the rights of Isaac. Now come on. Now when I ran that I discovered that actually even though Isaac Abraham received the son of the promise because Ishmael is his son I, Abraham started contemplating and having a plan I know God you promised and it will be through Isaac but even Ishmael is my son I know what to do I shall give Isaac a good portion of that blessing but I will set some little I'm going to give to Ishmael now Abraham started and the king, the plan of God and of course you know uh, this is something Abraham is so used to of he accepted to, to, to be led by his wife to change the plan of God. Now he is contemplating in his mind, I know God will not know. I will give Isaac what belongs to him, but I will just take a portion of it and give Ishmael because he too is my son. Now, this one, Sarah discovered. Now, let me speak to ladies here. Don't, don't sit foolishly at home. I say, Sarah, are you with me? And it's good for you to, 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 to be able to discern the thought process of your husband. So that you see where he is going. Because if you don't do that, you may find your husband in a very dangerous place. Sarah was able to read the body language of Abraham and the mind of Abraham. And discovered Abraham has a plan B to give a portion of Isaac's blessing to Ishmael. And Sarah says, over my dead body. Now, the Bible says in verse number 11, this one, <laughs> this one from Sarah, distressed Abraham. Are you with me? This tells you the magnitude in which Abraham and, and, and moved into the plan of having Ishmael share the privileges of Isaac. But, but let me remind you quickly, friends, that Isaac and Ishmael are not just sons of Abraham. Isaac and, Abra and Ishmael are sons to Abraham for God to illustrate the plan of redemption. Ishmael stands to the covenant that was given in Mount Sinai. That which became a stumbling block to a connection with God that had to be removed by the coming of Jesus. Are you with me? And Isaac stood for Jesus, uh, the man who had brought the new covenant. And in this covenant of blood, this covenant of the spirit cannot mingle with the covenant of flesh. God speaks to Sarah and reveals the principles of his plan to Sarah. But Abraham is stuck on a distorted version of the intentions of God. No, no, no. When, when, when Abraham was resisting, God himself came. Can somebody say amen? You know, I like the way God loves families. You see, God saw the way Abraham is deeply immersed in it. You know, of course we appreciate. I mean, there's no difference to Abraham between Ishmael and who? 
And I was like, these are his both sons. I mean, but, but there's no difference. And Abraham is willing to defend his son, Ishmael. And God comes and tells Abraham, you are out of doctrine. You are confused. You are unreasonable. Listen to everything your wife tells you. Mm. God, and you know, at this time, I want to believe Abraham, you, we used to call uh, Sarah and, and open the scriptures and speak to her and try to melt her heart and show how God wanted to be kind people, or to, be, to be compassionate people. Abraham was having Bible studies in the evening with Sarah just to convince her it is not good to act in humility. We need to be good people, good people of God. We can accommodate Ishmael. But God he comes and says, no, there's someone I have to interrupt it. And he comes and tells Abraham, close the Bible. Abraham, listen to your wife. Let me speak to men here. Let us know it's good to listen to our wives. And it's going to listen to your wife at times. Women can save. Now, you see, friends, I see Abraham asking, God, what do you mean? This is very unreasonable of you, God. You want me to chase away my own son into the wilderness? What a father will do that? I thought you are a heavenly father. Who do you disown me, God, in this way? Did you call me into this relationship that someday you may disown me and throw me in the wilderness? What are you teaching me? Do you want me to pass this on to the next generation? God, are you out of mind? Let me speak to you, somebody here this morning and confirm indeed there are times when God becomes unreasonable. There are times when God becomes unreasonable and granted it was such a case of God being unreasonable to persuade Abraham to throw away his own son and his wife into the wilderness. But this is the thing, my friends. Hmm. When God appears unreasonable. He wants to lead you to reason. Whenever God in your life appears and seems quite unreasonable, it is because of that particular, let me say this way, any time you feel that God is unreasonable in your situation, God is unreasonable. In fact, you are the one who is unreasonable. You are not able to reason from God's perspective. And God pretends to be unreasonable that he can align, he can transform your perspectives. And you see, Abraham has a perspective of him being the one in charge and in control of this good plan God has. But God says, Abraham, you are out of perspective. Your perspective is not mine. You are not reasoning. You are reasoning from the bodily and emotional perspective of this promise. But Abraham, I am reasoning from the spiritual realm. You don't understand and see what I am doing because what Abraham, you don't know, Isaac is here in place of Jesus. Abraham, until you align your perspective into a perspective, you will continue fighting your wife and become having a heavy heart. I want you, Abraham, get converted, see my perspective, that then we can walk with you. Now, let me say here, friends, there are many times when we even don't understand God. There are many times, even when, as we come to church, the way we came to church, we do not understand why God organized a church on earth. Many times, people just come to church, maybe perhaps because we know the name Seventh Day Adventist Church is a good name that is very symbolic, very significant, representing our people who are waiting for the second advent. I will walk to that church, and as you come in to the church, you walk through the gates. Since you came, it settles in your mind. At least today I went to church on Sabbath. You come, you sit in church, but you are so disillusioned, you are so disconnected at the purposes of God for you coming into the sanctuary. I just listened a while ago, and I'm standing here and talking about people who come and they are busy in the parking ministry. 
That's how confused at times you can become in church. We don't understand why God has threatened a church. People come to church for so many reasons. Perhaps for you, it is a place where you meet your community, time mates, and you connect with them. This is a place where we have a social connection, where we have welfare issues. So when I'm sick, when my son is marrying, when I'm believed, they can come through for me. This is why you come to church. So God looked after Abraham and Abraham got lost. It was Abraham. You've got to align your purposes with my purpose. Now the Bible says that Abraham rose early in the morning. Can you say amen? And asked the board servant to leave. What was Sarah's message to Abraham. It was one. Expel. Hmm. Expel the born servant, the born woman, and her son expel. No, this word expel is so powerful. It's like excommunicate. In other words, have it and settle it in your mind and in your heart. You never had a son called Ishmael. And God tells Abraham, walk them out of your gates. And the Bible shows, indeed, Abraham rose that morning. And he, gave, he, he took some a little bowl of water and some, some butter breads. And then he gave to... No, 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 no let, let, let me read that verse. Let me read that verse because, so that I can put some things in perspective. No, watch here. No, verse number 14. Are you there with me? So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water, putting it on her shoulder. He gave aid and the boy to her girl. He gave it, what is it? Both the water and bread, he gave it to well, that's not what the Bible says. He gave it and the boy to Hagar. This is drama. He did not give to Hagar and to the boy bread and water. He gave to the wife both bread, water, and the boy. In other words, Abraham is saying from this moment, he ceases to be my son. I will cease to think about him. The message is expel, excommunicate, have nothing to do with him. Abraham is bleeding in his heart. He has to disconnect himself and completely give Hagar all parental rights and he behaves as though they, he never knew them and he watches, he stands at the door and he witnesses them walking away into the wilderness. The Bible says as they were there, the little water and bread that God, Abraham had given them, finished. And Hagar so then cry. Can I say something in the next one or two minutes before I move from this verse? You see, friends, for you to be in a genuine, warm relationship with God, you must be willing to expel the things of flesh. You, you did not hear that point. For you to have a genuine walk with the Lord and become a faithful man and a woman of God, you must be willing to excommunicate, to expel, to remove everything that is of the nature of flesh, that which is enmity to your spiritual life. You must be willing. And let me speak to somebody this morning and say, it is not, you know, the things of flesh are so emotionally attached to us. Because this is what we identify ourselves with. This is what we are. This is what resonates with our mind. There are things 
that we cannot be able to stand before the Lord. There are things that we cannot be able to do for the Lord. There are things that we cannot be able to do with the Lord if we still keep the earthly mind and the earthly connections. Sarah chose Abraham, expel the one who is of flesh and accept the one who is of the spirit. Well, I read somewhere the book of Galatians chapter 5 verse number 24 where Paul says those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Those who are of the flesh, the vase is illustrated in the story of Ishmael and, and Isaac and Abraham as to crucify and a desire and inclination and a father in mind and thought of being a father to Ishmael and let him go. Let me speak to somebody this morning and let you know you've got to let some people go in your life for you to receive their destiny. Some of us are too much troubled. We are living in pain, in afflictions because you are holding on to things that have caused pain in our life. You've got to let them go. Let them go. And Sarah tells Abraham, Ex expel them. I know she is your wife. I know he is your son for sure. There's no difference between Isaac and Ishmael when it comes to the flesh. But I will let you know my husband, there are times when you've got to expel the things of flesh even when they are so dear to you. And so, Hagar is in the wilderness. The Bible says, The water, the bottle was used up. <laughs> and she placed the boy under one of the shops. Then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot. For she said to herself, let me not see the death of, a boy, of, of my boy. Now let me speak to you. Uh, this is the point here. <clears throat> Briefly. <clears throat> Abraham and Give, of course you know Abraham was a very rich man. It's ridiculous that Abraham, who was so rich in every aspect, he had camels, he had cows, he had sheep, he had all everything that he needed. He would only give his wife and his son just a bottle of what? Of water. A piece of bread. Before too long, it was over. Mm -hmm. I thank God for this statement in the Bible. This was the turning point of Abraham. Can somebody say amen? Abraham reasoned. Yes, I thought I was being a good father. I thought I was being a good Christian. But I did not know that I was standing in the way of the Lord. Did you know that most of us fight for God? Do things in church thinking we are fighting for the Lord, but actually we are fighting the Lord himself. Saul was there. So when Abraham discovered, oh, I was standing in the way of the Lord, he says, huh, I know I have all these things and people may think I'm a very bad guy. I, I, I just threw my wife and my child into the wilderness without anything. But I have come not to be convinced by God himself. It is not dependent on me to take care of anyone in, the, in this life. God wanted Abraham to come to the realization that man shall not live on bread alone but from every word that comes from the mouth of God. Can you say amen? And when Abraham discovered he was not the one driving it, God was in the picture and God had his own game. Abraham said, you go into the wilderness. God said you go. He knows what to do. Just remind you today, the message says, Jesus knows. And he takes care of you. Now Abraham was struggling to, to connect this reality that God knows the situation in his family. Abraham was struggling to be that good village elder who is a man when people are family conflict they will go to him to solve their issues but how will he continue solving people's marriage issues when he has thrown away his wife and his son he is not a good example 
Abraham was struggling with the status issues in the community. But God told him, Abraham, you've got to understand. When you come into a relationship with me, you cease to see the world from the every eye and see the world from heavenly eye. Listen to me, Abraham. And Abraham sends away Ishmael and, uh, and Agar with nothing, literally. The Bible says the water and the bread were finished. You cannot live this life because of the resources you have. We live in this life because of God. He has a thousand. No, I, 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 I was reading a text here and I found Jesus. A very interesting verse here. I found Jesus in John chapter 4, verse number 32, where he turned to his disciples who were behaving like Abraham. And Jesus turned to them and, and he told them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. <laughs> Somebody did not hear that one. You know, Jesus looks at the disciples who are also behaving like Abraham thinking that they are aiding Jesus. Thinking that they are supporting Jesus. Thinking that without them Jesus' ministry could not be accomplished. And Jesus looks at them they thought they are the ones who are caring for him and they were sympathizing with him. They forgot that Jesus is the sympathizing Savior. They forgot that Jesus is the bread of heaven that came from heaven. They forgot that Jesus is the great I am the term Jesus we are sympathizing with you you need to eat food and Jesus looks at them and tells them listen to me I have food to eat that you know not of let me speak to somebody this morning I tell you in your current situation which seems so hopeless and dire you have tried all the options you are not going through anything let me let you know God has a thousand ways to take you through your tribulations. He says, I know I have food to eat. I have ways to manage you. I have ways to bear you up. I have ways to heal you. I have ways to bring reconciliation. I have ways to fix your mess and make it to be a message. I have ways that you have no idea of. Allow me to be who I am. For my name is I am who I am. Jesus knows he takes care of you. And so the Bible says the woman lay there and she fell down. I, I can't continue watching my son dying because of the thirst and scorching sun. And she, she went and put him somewhere in the, some shrubs there. And then she went the other opposite direction. And she sat and crying, crying, crying. And the boy is crying the other side. And the Bible says, and God came. <laughs> Hallelujah. And God came. Uh, the, the, the angel of the Lord came. No, no. When you read the Bible and you meet with the phrase, the angel of the Lord, we are not talking about the angels or any of the angels. We are talking about Jesus himself. Jesus in the Old Testament was identified as the angel of the Lord. Carefully read your Bible. There are phrases where you meet with the angel was sent. But when you see the angel the angel of the Lord is in reference to Jesus in the Old Testament. And Jesus, the Bible says, and the angel of the Lord came to Hagar. Can somebody say amen? Jesus came to Hagar. Looked at Hagar in her tears, in her hopelessness, and asked Hagar, what heals you, Hagar? Hallelujah. What a challenging you, Hagar. Why are you distressed? Why are you feeling hopeless? Why are you feeling alone? Haga, why are you behaving like your husband, Abraham? We have walked this journey with you. I thought that you understood, you, you understood what was happening in Abraham's family. Let me let you know, Haga, I have come not to mock you the way your son was mocking Isaac, but I have come to lift you up. Ah, I have not come to laugh at you and tell you you, 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 you are such a, a foolish woman how could you sleep with somebody's husband Haga, I have not come to condemn you I have come to set you free Haga, I have not come to remind you of the bad days and the experiences you had in Abraham's home I have come 
to give you a new beginning. I, I just love God. You see, friends, I don't know, but I find this is a wilderness experience. But I don't know what kind of a wilderness experience you are in, even as speak now. I don't know what is represented in this sanctuary today. I wish I had power to get into your hearts and read every heart and project the issues of your heart on the screen for everyone to see what kind of a desert you're finding yourself in. Somebody this morning could be here but you're so much troubled because of the issues at your work. Please, you've been given a letter of the way your colleagues are treating you by every look soon. You are going to exit from that employment. You are so troubled. Somebody could be here their marriage is breaking or has broken and they don't know what to do. Somebody could be here. You are sick. Everything is breaking loose. Maybe you lost a loved one and you are in grief. You don't know how to come out of that pit. You are feeling you are down there. Let me remind you this morning, my friends, Jesus knows your pit. Jesus knows your wilderness. And he does not just know, but he is willing to come into your situation and pick you from that pit. Jesus is the sympathizing savior. Paul says, for we do not have a high priest. <laughs> If it is for me, who is not able to sympathize and empathize with our situation by one who was tried and tested and he walked the very path you're walking and he was in the wilderness, they were in the wilderness, and today he sits the right hand, right hand of my, our Father interceding for you. Can see somebody say amen? He says, I know your situation, I take care of you. Do not be dismayed. Bible says, God, Jesus asks Aga. You know, Aga was not believing. Says, Aga, look on the other side. And as Aga looked on the other side, she saw, <laughs> hallelujah, she saw a fountain. <laughs> You're not with me. You are so disconnected. I mean, Aga has been crying here because of the dryness of the desert. She says, I can't watch my baby die because of vastity of this wilderness, this hot sun of this desert. I cannot see. You know, Aga is just imagining and remembering how she would have been okay in Abraham's home. And according to Aga, it is only in Abraham's home she can walk back and be given water. But now she can't walk back there. So she has left to die. But God who watches his children from above and who makes things from nothing, he created a spring for Haga and her son. You're not with me. You see, the angel, you, you remember that story of, of, of Elijah, how he was fed? You, you remember that story? Mm -hmm. No, the, 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 the reverend were, were bringing a piece of bread to the man of God. But the story of Haga, Jesus did not bring water in a bottle, he, he did not come to quench their the, the, the current vast. Jesus chose to create an everlasting fountain that which cannot dry in the desert and tell Saga, even though you are to live in the desert forever, I supplied for you. This is what God says, I know and I take care. I don't know. What desert you're in this morning or this afternoon. But I just came by to let you know that we've got our Savior. God, our Savior, who is acquainted with our tribulations. But, 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 but the last point, then I see it. The Bible says, and the Lord. <laughs> I love this one. Verse 19. Hmm. Are you there? Hmm. Then God opened the eyes 
and she saw. <laughs> uh, the Lord opened the eyes of Hagar and she saw. I suggest to us this morning, maybe what you think is your problem actually is not a problem. Well, Hagar is crying here or in the provisions are there for her. But because she is so much blinded by the pain of betrayal, by the pain of abandonment, by the pain of being threatened that she is not a human, by the pain that she was going through, Hagar was so much blinded she couldn't see anything good in the Lord. I, I, I want to believe that the reason why, by the way, have you ever asked yourself this question? Why is it that when Jesus came, the angel of the Lord, he did not tell Hagar, I have heard your prayer. Hmm. Have you ever thought, what? The angel comes and says, I have heard the cry of the Lord. But the Bible says, Hagar was crying. What prevented Hagar's cry from being heard in heaven, but the cry of the son was heard. I don't know, but I'm just, I can speculate. Maybe because Hagar's heart was full of bitterness. Anger. Malice. Clamor. She was cursing everyone. She was calling Abraham names. She was calling Sarah names. She was cursing God. In that situation, her heart was heavy and she couldn't want to reason in any other way. But she is being mistreated. And because of that, God will never come through to a heart that is living in bitterness. Most of us today, our prayers are delayed from being answered because we approached the prayer hour with bitterness and a spirit of revenge. God, do something in my life that they may see. Hmm. Well, God, I worship you, God. Well, God, find them what I do, what I do. So you, and you think God is going to do that? That was where Hagar was. Pain, bitterness towards Abraham and what they have done. But the boy was innocently and genuinely crying for help. The boy did not know A or B or Z. He was there asking for anyone to help. It is when you approach God with a clean, contrite heart that God comes through for you. I don't know what is the situation this morning. But I'm here to tell you, he knows. And he takes care of you. Maybe what you need is the opening of the eye. Some of us are too blind. You walk in the church every Sabbath, but there's a sister you don't greet. You know who I'm talking about. You know it. You drive here every Sabbath. You come and you see all the parking lots are fully occupied. There's only one remaining, but then person Park next to this remaining park is what to consider as your enemy. You rather go out of the gate than park close to this person. You go park here and then you walk here. You come, you sit. And you've brought your burdens to Jesus. Oh, to Jesus. Uh, what are you surrendering? And you couldn't afford parking next to your neighbor. Let me speak to us people. We've got to align ourselves with the perspective of God. Says when you're beaten this side, turn the other side. Oh, I pray that we may lay off every bitterness, and every anger. Let us become brothers and sisters in the house of God. Let us break the barriers. We are too much tribal people. Clanism, social status. Let me speak to you, friend, this afternoon. Let you know there is no class in heaven. Jesus heal. Jesus heal from now. God doesn't care where you live in this Nairobi. 
when, whether in Runa or Karen or in Kibera, it, does, it doesn't matter to God. What God is looking out from you every Sabbath as you come here is how clean your heart is as you walk into his house. I'm just saying, maybe what you need in this morning, this message, is not to be reminded of your problem, but your eyes to be opened. Because the provisions are there. Ready, waiting. It is because of your blindness that you cannot see. And says, buy from me the medicine for your eyes that I can let you see. He knows. And he takes care of you. I want you to stand as you sing that song. Be not dismayed. Whatever be the time, he will take care of you. I pray for the opening of your eyes. Just to remind you, this message. God is not dealing with Hagar and Ishmael. God is not dealing with Sarah. God is dealing with the distorted view of Abraham about God's kingdom. And just Abraham, we've got to deal with you. I need you to align yourself. Somebody sang and said, what needless pain we bear. Because we do not take everything to God in prayer. prayer. But then the question is, why don't you take everything to God in prayer? It's because you do not believe there are some things that God can do. You are still fighting and struggling like disciples in the sea. You are still fighting and struggling. God tells you, surrender yourself to me. Do not be dismayed. As we do this first answer, I want to give somebody who says, Jesus, I am in a situation where Hagar was. I've gone through a wilderness experience. The pain in my heart, no man, no woman can understand. I am in a point of giving up in my life. But Jesus, if you create a fountain of water, for Hagar, please God, can you create even something, even, even, even just a little water, and come and quench me, Lord. I am drying up in my spiritual experience. I need you, Jesus. If you are fair, I want to ask you to make a way up front here before we pray. Let's sing, do not be dismayed, as I give someone a chance this afternoon to count before the Lord. Your pain, just come to him. Through days of toil, I don't know what is the wilderness this morning. Just, just come to Jesus. Just come to Jesus. Thank you, my sister. Just come to Jesus. Don't fear. Just come to Jesus. I don't know what is the experience. I don't know what is the experience. But you are going through an unpleasant experience. Bitterness, pain, afflictions. You don't know what to do. Just come to Jesus. Let's tell him, Jesus, we're here like Hagar was there. Come through for us. Just come. Just come. Just come. He'll take care of you. I can assure you this morning, He will take care of you. He will. He will. He will. Just come, my sister. Just come, my brother. Just come. Just come. Your husband may have abandoned you with a lot of responsibilities. You're feeling alone in this life. Come to Jesus. He'll take care of you. Your spouse or your parents or your family 
have abandoned you, neglected you, you're struggling. In a, you know very well you have a brother or a sister who can come through for you, but they are laughing at you, they are looking at you and are struggling in the city. Jesus it says, Come to me, I will take care of you. Trust you. As you do next circumstance, I want somebody to come and say, Jesus, you're the only one I have today. Come through for me. Just come. Just come. Just come. Just come. Just come. God will take care of you. Stanza three. All you may need. Just trust. Just come. God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day on the way. He will take care. Just come. Doesn't matter what you're going through. He will take care of you. He will take care of you. Just come. You may have lost your job. It could be hell. It doesn't matter. Just come. Just come. Just come. sister, brother, who says I need to go but something is stopping you. I want us to do stanza four again and listen to the words no matter what may the test. I feel like somebody struggling. Just come to Jesus. I, I, I don't know but, I, but I, I know the one who took you through that desert is able to take you out of that desert. He was there at the children of Israel and tells them, I took you through the desert for all these years. He can bear you up today. Let's do the last stanza for stanza four. And we sing slowly because there's somebody who needs to come. No matter what before we pray. God will take care of you. God will take care of you. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Through every
we are praying. And as we pray, just remember today's adventurers uh, all over the world to speak to God's people, to remind them that Jesus knows. And he takes care of you. No matter what is your experience. Maybe you don't know how to pay your bills. Maybe you came here to look for friends to help you with money to go and pay house rent or something. I want to turn your eyes to Jesus. Because this man will disappoint you. But I can assure you today, Jesus will take care of your bills. You can trust him. Let us pray. A gracious Father in heaven. Thank you for demonstrating through the life of Abraham that indeed it is not by resources we have, the wealth and the treasures, but it is through your presence in our lives. That's why you chose the name of our Savior to be Emmanuel, which means God together with us. That is why when he was leaving, going back to heaven, he said, and lo, I am with you till the end. That to mean there's no single day we are without the care of Jesus. Don't help us that our eyes may open and see Jesus. Oh, help us our eyes to open and see the fountains of water in our wilderness experiences. Lord, help us our eyes to open to see as you stretch your hand and touch our hearts and soothe us and comfort us with the pierced hands that we can say, if the Lord is for us, there's no one can be against us. Jesus, help us today to know that you are not a God who is weak to save. You looked at your servant and asked him, is my hand too short to save? Lord, many of us are going through pain, going through depressions, going through brokenness, bleeding in our hearts, but we are so hopeless in all these things. But I pray today, Lord, that people may hear the adventurous message that he did. Jesus knows and he takes care. They can put themselves in the situation of hunger. And here Jesus says, I have sad, I have seen, I have come. Like David, we can say, I waited patiently to the Lord. And he inclined on me. He heard my cry. And brought me up from the horrible pit. And set. And, and from the mud clay. And set my feet on a rock. And established my steps. That today we have nothing to fear for what is in the world. Because if we know who is with us, we shall go forward. Saying with the poor, we had pressed from every side. But we are not giving up. For who is on our side is greater. Lord, that we may have the experience of Elisha and Gehaz. When Gehaz saw how the army of Aram came around them and he was terrified and he feared, man of God Elisha spoke to him and told him, Gehaz, I need your eyes to open and see the multitude of angels of heaven who has come to fight for us. And indeed, as his eyes were opened, he saw great army of the Lord that today we may see how swiftly and powerfully you are pulling us from our pits. We will never give up, but we will keep trusting because through Christ we are more than conquerors. My sister, my brother, 
I don't know what is experience. I don't know what is a wilderness. I don't know what is your pain. I don't know even what to do with your pain and with your pit. But one thing I have today, I have one who bears people through the wilderness. I bring him to you today. Accept Jesus. He says, I know you. I take care of you. Jesus, thank you. I plead with you today, Lord. Every single of your children who walked in here today, the adventurers and the very old ones in the church, the burdens they brought today in the church. Please, Father, Jesus, honor your promise. You said, come unto me. You who are heavily laden, I shall give you rest. Take away this burden from your people. Lift their loads from them, Father. Pull them from the horrible pits they find themselves in. Create fountains in the wilderness. Come and sit with them and tell them, I will make your son a good nation. And I thank you because you know he did. Even though Hagar and Ishmael were never taken away from the wilderness, but they were established in the wilderness. Make a table for us before our wilderness that the enemies will see and glorify your name. That they can say indeed that as a God of his people, I choose to trust in him. Wipe away our tears, my father, and heal our sickness. And give us new doors of opportunities. And give us courage to face every fall. Because you are within our ranks. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.